Dan, thank you, Erwin. Erwin is my contact with Echo, and it's a real blessing to be here and to learn more of what the, this great organization is doing. Um, so I'm not going to talk about myself. I'm not a politician. Um, I want to talk about plants, and particularly a group of plants, which, I hope this comes as a shock to you, are the greatest cause of yield reduction in sub-Saharan Africa. These are plants that eat other plants. Absolutely remarkable creatures. And what I want to do this afternoon is give you a general introduction to a few parasitic plants. There's all kinds of weird parasitic plants that aren't of agronomic importance that I've studied in Africa, particularly in South Africa and Namibia. And I'm not going to be talking about those. I want to talk about those which are of economic importance. Can everyone hear? Yes. And is this better or worse? Or? Uh, <clears throat> in our opening devotions on our first day, we were reminded that God had created the dry land. And I just want to say something about the significance of the plants in the scriptures. Not only is symbolism, I mean, think about it. The Lord Jesus said, I am the vine. Uh, Solomon was a botanist. He was actually, little known biblical fact, he was a botany professor. And he talked about plants. And in 1 Kings chapter 4, verse 32, uh, he talks about some of the plants that occur in the Middle East. I want to talk about some of the plants that occur in Africa. This is a uh, statement written by Gabisa Ejecta, who is one of the top sorghum breeders in the world, in fact, he won the World Agricultural Prize, sort of the equivalent of the Nobel Prize in Agriculture <clears throat> for his work on strike. He's an Ethiopian. And at an or a uh, symposium that he organized in uh, Ethiopia some years ago, we talked about the scourge of striga in Africa. And in the preface to the published proceedings of that conference, he, said, he gives this remarkable statement. Nearly 300 million people in sub-Saharan Africa are adversely affected by striga, and up to 50 million hectares have striga infestation. That's a stunning number. <clears throat> Now, I've been in this business for, since before most of you were born, um, and I have, unfortunately, not seen a reduction in the impact of these plants in agriculture. I hope that uh, occasions like this, where we make people aware of them, will lead to more meaningful applied research. So what is a parasitic plant? It's a plant that eats other plants. Now, obviously, plants don't have teeth and, you know, digestive system in the way that we think of them. <clears throat> what they do is they form a very specialized root called a hostorium, which penetrates into the root or the stem of other plants. And this hostorium is the defining feature of parasitic plants. It's a modified root, as you can see here from a... This is a, uh, the host, this is the parasite. So what happens, this, here is the parasite invading the host xylem, the parasite invading the host xylem. So it forms a morphological, a physiological bridge between the parasite and the host. The movement can be both ways. The parasite removes nutrients from the host usually through a xylem to xylem link up. That doesn't mean that the products of photosynthesis aren't transported. They, they move through the parenchyma cells, <clears throat> not through the flow. But the parasite also affects the host plant by moving hormone-altering chemicals into the host. And it will actually change the architecture of the host plant. Bottom line, if you don't have a hostorium, you don't have a parasite. So why, why mention that to a group of people who are interested in control? Because if we can impede the development of this organ through biochemical, uh, cultural, other ways, we can affect the parasitism. 
So I've selected just a few of these plants to talk about. Uh, the dodders, cuscuta, which I know occur around here, <coughs> and the really bad ones, the uh, witch weeds, species of striga, and this is a group of plants which I'd like to make you aware of because I fear that with increased cultivation, particularly of sunflower, you might get some of these parasites. <coughs> so let's talk first of all about the dodders. You can think of dodders as being like parasitic spaghetti that somebody's thrown over a plant. The plant consists of, are you ready to write this down? A stem. And this stem twists around the host and then produces, what's the name of the parasitic organ? The hostorium. It produces the hostorium that then bores into the host. And you can see right here, you can see the hostoria. And here are the hostoria right here. This is controlled through an elegant system of, of thigmotropism where the plant responds to, to the feel of the host plant. These are incredible plants, these daughters. They can actually sense the nutritional value of the host before they attack it. It's been clearly shown in experimental. Um, now, on the seed packet that we were given, there's a variety of plants, <clears throat> two of which are affected by daughter. One is the jute mallow. The other is, there it is again, amaranthus. You can't have a talk without mentioning amaranthus, so I had to put this in here. This is a uh, very weedy field of amaranthus in southeastern Turkey. And you can see that it's just being destroyed by the daughter. Or this. This is jute mallow in Israel. Where's the jute mallow? It's uh, <clears throat> more like mute mallow because it's being destroyed by the cascuta. What the cascuta does is to remove the products of photosynthesis, reduces yield, um, really bad news. So, you have this parasite in Africa. I'm frequently sent these plants to identify because people are intimidated by the identification of the cascutus. <clears throat> and I'll, I'll get a review of paper and people will claim that it's cascuta campestris, which is an American plant, which is the most widely distributed uh, parasite in the world, and most of the, the parasites, most of the cascutas that you see in agriculture in other countries are actually this American plant. So just bear that in mind. There are native plants. <clears throat> so how do we sum this up? The, the hosts are diverse, except monocots. does not attack monocots, except onions for some strange reason. These are obligate hemiparasites, that is, they produce some of their own chlorophyll, but they're dependent upon the host. And the <coughs> control has been well studied because cascuta is a major problem in the production of alfalfa, bursim, uh, <coughs> metacago, whatever name you call it. However, seed cleaning is a very effective way to uh, purify the seed because the cuscuta seed has a very rough coat on it. Okay, <clears throat> are we ready to talk about the most serious root parasite in the world? These are the witch weeds. Africa is loaded with witch weeds from Morocco to uh, the southern part of South Africa. <clears throat> These are all in the genus Striga, and <clears throat> they have a very unique biology. Now, I want to emphasize that these plants we're talking about are weeds, but they're not typical weeds. The main problem with weeds in agriculture is competition, right? It competes for water, light, nutrients. These are parasites. So you have to think your, you have to change your thinking about the control of these weeds. You can't control them in the same way as you can control other weeds. <clears throat> they are really evil characters. The seed biology needs a lot of attention, has received a lot of attention. And get this, one plant 
can produce about 200,000 seeds. These seeds can live for 20 years in the soil. Last year, when Erwin and I were in Rwanda, I gave a brief talk about these parasites, and the farmers brought them in, probably spreading them around the country inadvertently. <clears throat> One of the farmers told me that he had a field of, I think it was sorghum, and it was so infested with striga that he stopped growing sorghum there. <clears throat> Excuse me, and he planted other uh, crops. Fifteen years later, thank you, fifteen years later, he thought the field would be okay, and he planted uh, sorghum again, and it was destroyed by striga. The seeds that survived in the soil. <clears throat> Thanks, Erwin. <coughs> These are obligate parasites, and they germinate underground, and they attack the host before and to begin the damage to the host before they're ever seen. So the, the, the life cycle is very complicated. <coughs> the seeds are shed. They have to undergo a dormancy period. We don't know what breaks that dormancy, uh, but then they will respond to water and they will germinate. They will form a hostorium if there is a host nearby and they attach to the host root Then they begin to grow all underground Finally, they emerge, and their only reason for emerging is for reproduction. So these points of intervention, here's another way of looking at the same thing. We have to think, if we're going to think about control, we have to think about points of intervention where we can block this insidious parasite. So I'm going to talk mainly about three species, all three of which occur in Tanzania. Striga hermonthica, Striga asiatica, and Striga gesnerioides. These have no good common names. <clears throat> Striga hermonthica does the most damage, is the most important of these three species. It grows to about uh, a meter tall, maybe a little taller sometimes. Uh, huge infestations of the plant. Here, for example, is the scene in Burkina uh, that I took near a village where you can just see the purple haze, or Kadubli in central Sudan. It looks like it's a field of pink flowers, which it is because the sorghum crop has been destroyed. The flowers are very, very attractive. They're uh, pollinated by a diversity of insects. So you can't control an insect to control the parasite. This was an idea that was uh, put forward by one of the people at IITA after uh, we had described the biology of the flower because the diversity of insects pollinated. Now you were asking about the seeds. Here they are. This is an outcrosser, so there's more variation within a population than there is among a population. Well, among populations, which is important if you're a breeder. Here's the seeds again. Here's the human hair. The seeds are small. They are dust seeds. Now, take a look at that little teeny seed there. You know, the, <clears throat> the Lord Jesus lived in an agrarian society. He liked to talk about seeds and agriculture. Um, this is one of the marvels of creation. This little teeny seed right here, look at that. Teeny, teeny seed is actually a computer. You've heard of microchips? This is the ultimate microchip. Now take a look at that little seed there. Think of that little seed. Whoops. Look at the seed. It's smaller than an amaranth seed. Two-tenths of a millimeter wide. In that seed is the, all of the wiring, all of the electronics, all the circuitry to measure time, host, host distance, water, Incredible! The biochemical communication that goes on, received a lot of attention recently, is absolutely remarkable and fascinating. The way these plants talk to one another it reminds you of somebody, you know, with a walkie-talkie radio going back and forth as they're approaching one another. Seeds are T90, very, very small. So many of them uh, 
formed. These are seedlings that I took from a millet plant in Gambia. Uh, talking to farmers, they, they had a field of millet. And in the middle of this field was sort of a cone of depression. And the plants were stunted. They had a different architecture. And if you've worked with Stryka, you say, aha, I predict that this is a Stryka infestation. So we dug up those, some of those plants. The farmers were amazed. Here are these plants, these seedlings, growing on the roots of the sorghum. And at that time, they're removing, remember now, they are totally dependent upon the host, so they're removing all of their nutrition from the host, and they're damaging the host. One of the things that these plants, these striga does is, it tells the host, stop making stem and make more roots, which makes sense if you're a root parasite. So there are more places for attachment of these Ostoria. And I want to emphasize this. This is one of the reasons these are not typical weeds. There's damage before detection. Damage before detection. So that when you see the parasite, it's too late. Because at this stage, the damage to the crop is already done. It's irreversible. You can kill the parasite, but you're not going to uh, help the host any. This is one of the great problems in uh, striker control. Now the distribution of this uh, plant is mainly Sahelian in its distribution. Um, historically, there have been huge infestations uh, in Tanzania, back uh, reported as early as 1950. Um, I, I believe it's been spread further south. I've seen it in Namibia, and I think it's been also been reported in Angola. <clears throat> So, to sum up this, all the major grain crops, maize, sorghum, millet, finger millet, rice, teff, are affected by this parasite. Maize seems to be particularly hammered, probably because it evolved in an area where there uh, was no strike. These are obligate parasites. They depend on the host for germination and for hostorial initiation. They're green when they emerge. That's partial photosynthesis, but the damage has been done. Control, widely studied. If in developed agriculture, and mechanized agriculture, I should say, there's good control of herb, uh, with herbicides. <clears throat> I'm not a wheat by wheat scientist or an agronomist, but there's lots of data on that. Ethylene gas, a very simple plant hormone. <coughs> very simple. Ethylene gas, when injected into the soil, after the seeds have been conditioned, will germinate the seeds, and you can reduce the number of seeds in the soil. Just uh, yesterday, I heard from a colleague in Sudan who has been working on a project to sanitize fields by injecting ethylene. This is obviously highly mechanized, specialized agriculture. Um, <clears throat> the push-pull, I'll, I'll say a little bit about that later. The second species, Looks completely different, but it's also bad news. This is Stryka asiatica. Here it is on millet in Zimbabwe. <coughs> it's the most widespread Stryka species in the world. Um, I've seen it in India. Uh, it occurs in the Arabian Peninsula. And in Malaysia, the plants are harvested as a kind of medicine. There are many places in the world where these witch weeds are considered to have like magical properties. A farmer in Mali told me that to, to uh, sort of ensure his crop, uh, it's, he, in the seeds, he puts a few striga plants on the top of the seeds. Well, that's, you know, <laughs> bad news. Uh, yeah, that's, that's not the way to do it. Uh, again, it attacks uh, all, all the grains as well as sugarcane. Now, Strike Asia was introduced to the United States in the 1950s, and as a re in the Carolinas, about 15 counties in the Carolinas, three counties in South Carolina, right on the border between the North and South Carolina. How it got there, we don't know, but it, it stimulated 
millions and millions of dollars of research which has really advanced our understanding of witch weeds around the world. So it was really a blessing in disguise. It's been largely eradicated now through an extensive quarantine program, herbicides, methylene gas. <coughs> so to sum up Strike Asiatica, uh, put, put sugar cane up here again, like all strikers, it's a popular parasite and good control. Um, I haven't mentioned anti-transference. One of the things that happens when the striker emerges from the soil and develops its leaves, it has a very, very high transpiration rate. Basically, the stomata on the leaves stay open. And if you spray it with an, the plants with an anti-transparent, you'll kill the, the witch weed. It's actually a way of controlling the witch weed. The third of the big three is Striga gesneroides. This is the most unique in the genus. Here's a seedling of it from Nigeria. <clears throat> it's self-pollinating and it attacks dicots. It never attacks, never is a big word in biology, isn't it? But it never attacks monocots. Um, the most serious effect that we would want to consider uh, today is its impact on cowpea. I've heard cowpea mentioned several times uh, during our meeting. And Strika gesneroides is a huge problem on cowpea, particularly in Nigeria. And that legume is an important source of protein in Nigeria. So at IITA, there's been a large research effort on Strika gesneroides on cowpea. <coughs> So, what does this research end up with? You cannot breed a plant resistant to striga. You can breed a plant which is tolerant of striga. There's, there's no such thing as total resistance to striga unless you're, you know, like a monocot with this species. So, the emphasis is on breeding for tolerance. And there's been all kinds of uh, helpful lines in, in cowpea. And now, of course, with all these molecular markers, uh, breeding has re reached a new level. But look at the families that it attacks. It has a very wide range of families that it attacks. Here it is in cowpea. It also attacks the Bambera nuts, Vigna subterranea. Um, here you can see the damage on the, on the cowpeas. Uh, typical uh, mixed farm here with, with uh, all kinds of different plants cassava and cowpea and uh, some sorghum. And the farmer here in uh, Benin is showing me the, the cowpea. And here you can see cowpea attached to the roots of the, I mean, you can see the strike attached to the roots of the, of the cowpea. One of the things which is unusual about the strike is it forms this large tuber-like structure. This, this species occurs all over Africa. I've seen it in, in Ethiopia and Botswana and uh, Senegal, and it grows in, in the Maghreb, uh, Madagascar, it's all over the place. So how do we sum up Striga gesneroides? Typical Striga, uh, with a parasite. Uh, sometimes it has very little chlorophyll. Um, again, the most promising control is tolerance. <clears throat> now a couple of uh, sort of leftover species. Uh, one which is frequently confused with Striga hermantica is Striga aspera. The difference is in the shape of the corolla. It looks very clear here, but in the field it's, it's difficult sometimes to tell them apart. We've done molecular analyses, molecular systematics uh, of this in a project that I had with IITA. These are good species. Striga aspera is a good species taxonomically. Um, doesn't interbreed much with uh, Striga hermantica. Striga hermantica is a true agresto weed. It only occurs in cultivated fields. Only, again, a big term, I grow on the edges of fields, but it's strictly in agricultural fields. And here you can see the bend in the crowd. <coughs> it's only, it's an agresto weed. It, one of the crops which is impacted by this more than others, 
um, at least there hasn't been much study, but I was impressed in um, Guinea that the funio, you don't grow funio here, I'm sure, digitella, exilis, sometimes it's, what's it called, poverty, poverty rice or something. In the very porous soils on the uh, Futagello of uh, Guinea, the, it looks like just pure laterate. Um, it, this funio is grown, and strika aspera is a big problem. And here you see uh, one of the only controls these women are out weeding. Now, <clears throat> weeding has a good aspect in that it will reduce the amount of seeds if you harvest it and collect it as soon as it emerges. What often happens is that it will be harvested when the capsules are already developed and the seed is spread all over the place. So weeding has to be at a certain stage before the seeds develop. <clears throat> on sugarcane, damaging sugarcane, um, on millet, you can see millet here and the damage of the striker there. Again, it's a typical striga. Uh, funio is a, a attack. I don't know of any other striga. I don't know of other strigas that attack funio. Last of all, the striga Forbesii. This has been poorly studied. One of my graduate students did a project in Zimbabwe where striga Forbesii was a major uh, problem in uh, sorghum and maize. Um, where I saw was in a, uh, the, there was a huge sugarcane project called the Juba Project in Somalia. And sugarcane is, is a rigorous plant. I mean, you know, it's really pretty tough. And these plants decimate it. They, they, it they're short, you can see how short the plant is here. They have a profound effect on, on sugarcane. This is mainly East African in distribution. Um, <clears throat> occurs in Tanzania. Uh, I don't think it's a problem here, like it has been in Somalia. So, sugarcane, um, maize and sorghum in Zimbabwe, those are the only um, places that come to mind. Typical striga, very little information on control. But I would imagine that control is pretty much the same for most of these strikas. So, those are the witch weeds. Just so you know which weeds we're talking about. Um, and I want to talk about two other groups, and then I'll be finished. This is uh, sometimes called yellow witch weed, uh, Electra fogelii. There are two species which are widespread in Africa Electra acessifolia and acessifolia and Electra fogelii. Um, the big problem here is on cowpea and sunflower. It's a real problem with sunflower, for example, in South Africa. Um, I've seen it on the sunflower in South Africa. Um, it will also attack bambara nuts, which I, they are grown here, aren't they? Bambara is grown here. Um, again, it's uh, very much like striga, but we, we know very little about its biology compared destroying it because it's not as widespread. Attractive plant. Uh, there's some work done on herbicides for it. Okay, those, those are the witch weeds. I want to end up with the broom rapes. These are species of Morabanki, and you'll see that, you'll immediately see how different these are from the witch weeds. They lack chlorophyll. No Orobanki has chlorophyll. So they are called holoparasites. They're total parasites. They have, they're more, most diverse in a Mediterranean climate. What does that mean in a practical sense? They germinate at a lower temperature. Striga and Electra are tropical plants. Orobanki is more temperate. They don't attack grains. Um, here is Orobanki ramosa. It's one of the most serious parasitic weeds in the world. Here's a partial list of its hosts. You can see it has a huge diversity 
or a great diversity of hosts um, it can be very, very damaging. For example, here's tobacco in uh, Bulgaria. You can see how these have been, these tobacco plants have been humiliated by the uh, ore banking and are sort of bowing in obeisance to it. You can see the ore banking in here. Here's the tomato crop in Sudan. Tomatoes are particularly hammered. Uh, the uh, fruits don't develop, they look sort of saggy, and they, they rot early on. Uh, profound effect on tomatoes. Like striga, the damage is done underground before the parasite emerges. So these are, these are orobanky plants. You have to think of these as weeds. These are weeds that need to be controlled. They don't look like weeds, but they are weeds in the seedling stage They've attached to the host and are already affecting the host, but you can't see them because they're uh, <clears throat> sort of like the CIA. They do everything underground. <laughs> uh, here is uh, a field of fava beans being attacked in Ethiopia. This is a major constraint to legumes in the Nile Valley and in Sudan, and in Egypt and in Sudan. Um, Here's an experiment I did uh, years ago to show the effect of one orobanky on a broad bean. This one's parasitized. This is the control. You can see how profound the effect is there. Imagine a whole field of, of that. This is the sunflower orobanky. Here's a field of sunflowers in Bulgaria. Uh, the heads are not filled out completely. The leaves are, look like they're drought. Uh, stricken because of the impact of the orobanky. As you can see, the orobanky completely lacks chlorophyll. So how do, you, how do we control these things? I'm not an agronomist, but I was told I couldn't come if I didn't mention control. So um, uh, herbicides, there's a lot of information on that. And what is really exciting from a biological standpoint is as I mentioned earlier, this remarkable, sophisticated communication between host and parasite. One of the uh, chemicals that is used, I put a picture on the right-hand side, is ethylene gas. You can see there a rig that injects ethylene gas into the soil. Um, I'll say something about push pull in just a bit. It used to be that shifting cultivation was one way to control it. This was done in Sudan for a long time by people who were living uh, in, in the uh, area to the uh, east of uh, Sudan, in the Kordofan. Um, an area becomes affected with striga. They would simply abandon that for three or four years, and then move to another area, and then go back. And, and that way, the native grasses germinate the seeds as well. And they would go back. Well, with population pressures, that's not working anymore. And I mentioned about breeding for tolerance. And here is the uh, push-pull system, John Pickett, Rothamsted's uh, work. Uh, the basic idea is that you have desmodium. You can use other legumes. The desmodium produces a chemical that repels the stem borer. So around the edge, you plant nature grass, or this bracky area that was mentioned this morning. This is also another good one. Um, and then the insect is drawn out here, away from the maze. And a byproduct of all of this is that the desmodium causes suicidal strike germination. Now, there have been yield increases like 75% with this system. Um, there are problems, however. This is a perennial. Um, sometimes farmers need to put a fence around their, their field so that uh, to keep cattle out, that, that's a cost. Um, there's concern now with uh, temperature rise in the environment that this desmodium can't take it as it gets hotter and drier. So there are other species which are being uh, considered. Last of all, biocontrol. Um, there are weevils which attack striga. It's native to Africa, so there's a lot of native uh, uh, things here that attack it. This is a butterfly. 
buckeye butterfly, and this very interesting bacterium, Pseudomonas syringae, which produces ethylene gas. So IIGA had a project of inoculating sorghum seed with this bacterium. The idea being that as the seed germinated, then it would release, that this bacterium would then release ethylene gas, which would cause the uh, strike of the germinate. None of these have been shown to be really very uh, effective in controlling strike. Now here's a new control I just learned about. Using striga like marijuana. Now, I, I can just see this happening in the United States if you would say, hey, you know what, you can get high in striga, you'd have a great control program because people would be collecting this, this left and right. So one of the, uh, one of the uh, regional council members in this part of uh, Kenya uh, uh, found that people were smoking striga. Um, because it's supposed to have the same effect as marijuana. This may be a, a placebo effect. Um, I have to confess I've never smoked Striga, uh, so I don't know if that really works, but that's got to be the most unique control uh, that I've heard of. Last of all, sanitation. The way that which we just spread, like most weeds, is through human action. So I did a study when I was living in Sudan of looking, I went to a, a, a seed store and I bought some alfalfa seed and I looked at the seed and I found cascuta seeds in the alfalfa seed. So the alfalfa had been harvested with the cascuta, not properly cleaned, so when the farmer plants the alfalfa, the cascuta will be there to take over. Uh, a similar study was done in West Africa going to the market and looking at sorghum and millet. And sure enough, in a fairly high percentage, I forget the numbers of uh, cases, those grains were contaminated with striga seed. So sanitation is important. Don't feed the striga. It's not fodder. It's not fodder. It will pass through, the seeds will pass through um, the uh, intestines of cattle and come out viable, or I should say its viability is not effective. Uh, my uh, colleague at the University of Khartoum did extensive work on this, and because there's, there's all this, you know, you're in a semi-arid region and you have all this vegetation, why not feed it to your cattle? Don't do it. Burn the striga. Pull the striga up and burn it, but pull it up before the seeds develop, because if it's pulled up, um, Remember, it's only coming out of the ground to flower because it's already got its nutrition. So once you separate it from the host, it will do whatever it can, plant speaking, to produce those seeds. So you have to get it early enough. We have a newsletter that I have co-edited for many years now on parasitic plants. You can get it. It's free. It has extensive literature review on all kinds of control measures drawn from the CABI uh, database and other databases. Um, and if you just send me an email, I'll put your name on the mailing list. So thanks. And uh, having been done, done this for so many years, there's so many people, um, I don't know if I can remember them all, so many institutions that have been such a, uh, such a help. Last of all, let's not forget this. We want to give all the glory to God alone. This is that, that strange parasite in South Africa. Thank you very much.